Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to start out by standing and singing. Blessed be your name. of Obin Road where Woodlawn Church meets and uh, we're excited that you're here with us this morning and uh, uh, it's a good day. It's beautiful weather. Uh, good to see some of those that have been out for a while back amongst us and uh, I don't think I have any announcements so we just need to remember, continue to remember Brenda and uh, her family. Time for America that we have seen in our lifetime. And I know the power of prayer. 
I want to invite you to bring your family and gather with other Christians, churches, and pastors. Fill a busload and join thousands to pray. Thus, this is the scripture. Thus the Lord was moved by prayer for the land. Now I know we can't go and I'm not trying to say let's get a busload and go. But what I am saying is, I think next Saturday we could set aside, they're doing this from 12 to 2. I think next Saturday we could set aside those two hours. I put a sign up sheet out on the table. 10 minute increments. increments. If you would just sign up for a slot, if you'd be willing to come and pray for 10 minutes for our nation, and I think we should pray for our church as well. Ask God what's his will for our church, as well as praying for our country that will come back to him. So if you would just, and if there's somebody already signed up in your slot, sign up anyway. We can have two or three at a time. It won't matter. I plan to be here. The door will be open. And if there's an empty slot, I plan to fill it. So we can pray for two hours, solid. Enjoy what they're doing. I think it would be really, really a blessing for us to be part of this, even though we can't go. You know, like, I might like to go. <laughs> we can't do this. So, and if you give me an extra minute, an extra minute. I want to share with you something. We went to the ark. I don't know how many of you have been to the ark. And, you know, when you look at that ark and you think about Noah, and you think, And I'd like to read you this sign. It says the ark, 500 feet by 85 feet equals 110, 540,000 square feet. Three levels. Now, I can't, had I not seen it, I can't even visualize that. How big it is. And on the sign it says problem. None. It was perfectly designed to survive the flood. Strength. Large enough for all the animals, people, and supplies. Dimensions are an ideal blend for strength, stability, and comfort. And I couldn't help but think, you know, the ark is a type of Jesus in Scripture. We are in him. We are secure. He's our strength, our stability, our comfort. In him, we can withstand the flood, the storm, whatever we are, uh, where, whatever. We are safe and secure, protected. So here, problems. In him, we can withstand all the floods. Strength. He is large enough to handle anything we're facing. Dimensions. He is a perfect blend of all the strength, stability, and comfort we need. I just thought that sign was so good. opportunity to come today to worship you, to praise you. You're an awesome God. Uh, and even though our nation is in turmoil and, and we need to turn back to you, you're still in control. You're still on the throne. And we, we know you got a plan. We know you're working it out. I pray that uh, you'll just uh, turn us around and, and get our eyes on you uh, as quickly as possible during all this. And, Help us learn from this and, and uh, never take our eyes off of you again. I pray that uh, you'll be lifted up by everything that's done this morning. You're the reason we gather. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Let's uh, sing some more. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me.
That is grace to know that we don't have to live in fear. We can choose to do it. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to be afraid of death. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's something that touches all of us for the time being. It's a temporary thing. But it touches all of us. Uh, but you know, uh, because of Jesus right now, we should not have the fear of death. Death itself has not been defeated. It's the last enemy that will be defeated. And it's the same day as defeated as far as God's concerned, right? The cross took care of that, but you read Revelation it says that death, the last until the last enemy death has been defeated and everything. So but the fear of death, we don't have to, we don't have to worry about that, guys. We know Jesus. All we're going to do is change location. That's all we're doing is change the location. Lisa has an uncle that says that he's going to live till the rapture comes. He said that for a long time. Remember, you know, he's 105 years old. I'm pulling for him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pulling for him. I hope he makes it. That means I haven't gotten long. We don't have long, but you know, uh, if you don't, that's all right. Because we don't have to fear that. It's an upgrade, exactly. That's what, that's what I always say, you know, to, you know is, is it better or is it going to be worse? Is God, what God's got planned for us better? We, we can walk in victory now, but what he's got planned <laughs> is even better. So we don't have to fear that. We don't have to fear anything. As far as living in the spirit of fear. Father, I thank you and I praise you that, uh, that we don't have to live in fear, Father God. That we're not slaves to fear. We're not slaves to sin. Uh, Father, that we can walk each and every day, each and every moment in victory. And yet, Father, I know uh, because of our doubt, our lack of faith, at times our unbelief and just being immature, being human, that uh, at times we still struggle. But uh, that just proves more and more why we needed a Savior. Why we needed someone who could do this for me and then do it through me. So, Father, I pray that, that you have not left us alone. That although our Savior is in heaven and that's a good thing because he always lives to make intercession for us. And he is coming back. But you have not left us alone. You have sent the person of the Holy Spirit. You have given us your word, your truth, your your promises, Father, that we can stand on and that we can trust you in. And, Father, I so admit that our understanding many times is so limited. But I thank you that it doesn't change you and that we can always stand on the fact that you're a good and loving God, that you're in control, and that uh, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. So, Father, I pray that we'll... Uh, Embrace that today, and as, uh, as you teach us, Father, that you'll just speak to us, show us your truth. Father, give us an eternal view. The Father, teach us to walk in victory and to trust you. These things I ask and thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at a passage today that is a very, very, very familiar passage to us. <clears throat> um, I'm going to do it, God willing, very different than anything you've ever seen with it, most likely. I know I've never heard it done this way, uh, but uh, the reason I want to do it this way is to is that we can see context, what context is, and how important that is, but that we can also understand that there's context tied in with God's heart. So, so many things have been given to the nation of Israel that refer strictly, specifically to the nation of Israel. But God's heart also allows us to take part in those blessings also. So, uh, and as we do this, I 
also want us to think about the study that we have just completed, which showed that Jesus came to alter the kingdom to the nation of Israel, and they rejected the kingdom once again. They rejected the kingdom. To this day, the majority are rejecting the kingdom. But you know, here's the thing about God's heart. None of that changed the promise he made to Abraham. It does not change the promise he made to Abraham. So, is he going to fulfill his promise one day or not? Yes, absolutely he will. It's going to be extremely tough on the nation of Israel until they finally get it. So, the principle I gave from that too is, uh, you know, God's got a lot of promises in his heart for us too, but you know, if we choose to reject it like God did, we know we're just going to be mighty tough on this at times, too. But we see God's heart. His, God, his heart was to what? To offer the kingdom, you know, to always, you know, I'll forgive. I'll forgive. You know, you can trust me. But, once again, there are stipulations involved. In you know, we have a part to play. So that's what I want to kind of look at today. Kind of give you the con to kind of uh, read this verse and then go back and I want to look at four or five chapters and bring you kind of up to date on what led to this this verse that we all know and everything to see the context and, and <clears throat> I want to let you know one time too that I'm going to leave one verse I'm going to leave a lot of verses out but, you know we're not going to say that you'll be able to cover four or five chapters but I'm going to leave one verse out specifically and then we'll go back and we'll cover it too so. Uh, I think I, I was when I started digging into it more so, you know, uh, this verse really jumped out at me. All right, so I want to read Second Chronicles chapter 7. Now, Chronicles is kind of an addendum to Kings. Chronicles adds what First and Second Kings doesn't have sometimes chronicles adds to it's all during the same time period and it's it's a it's a chronicles of the kings of the, of the times of the kings and what was going on in, in the kings of Israel and what was going on <clears throat> okay chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 and my people who are called in my name Humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will hear their land, heal their land. It's kind of interesting, you know, we talked about this, uh, this uh, prayer uh, sign up and everything uh, in the session meeting a Monday night. You know, I thought, and I, of course I mentioned last week before I knew about this, that I, that I wanted to kind of go over this verse with us and everything and look at it in context and everything. But it's kind of interesting that, that it's just by coincidence that it's just uh, they're having this prayer rally and all that kind of stuff, you know? So, uh, uh, for looking at it, here's the context in a nutshell. Here's a big context. This context is a statement from God, right? God said this, you know, and my people call on that name will humble themselves and pray, all right? This is a statement from God. Who's it made to? Well, it's made to Solomon. Okay? In context, it's absolutely made to Solomon. Concerning the people of Israel and the land of Israel. That's, that's the context. That, when we go over this, that, that can't even be debated, really. Okay? Although we'll be glad to debate it. All right? It's also made while Israel was under the Mosaic Covenant, which is the law. Okay, that's important to understand too. So I want to go over, uh, start with chapter 2 and kind of bring us up to date what took place before God made this statement and then to look at God's heart in this also. And I think we'll be able to see something. Let me ask you a question too. You remember uh, Judah went into captivity uh, by the Babylonians and Daniel, Azariah, Hanani, and Mishael, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken prisoner too, right? And then after the Babylonians failed by the Medes and Persians, that's when we have Daniel being thrown in the lion's den, right? You remember that? So Daniel, who was a young man, 
70 years earlier, was no longer a young man when this took place. Okay? Do you remember what got him thrown in uh, the lion's den? What was it? He wouldn't stop praying. He wouldn't stop praying, right? He wouldn't stop praying. He didn't go they, they, uh, all the other rulers of the Medes and Persians were jealous of Daniel. They said, we can't find nothing wrong with him, so we're going to get him to... Only, only way we'll get him is to uh, have something to do with his God. If we can get something there, we'll, we'll have him because he's not going to—he's not going to forsake his God. Of course, they got the ruler. Uh, I think it was Darius. Got the got the ruler to make this edit. You know, you can't pray to nobody but me, right? Of course, what would Daniel do? He would go up with it three times a day. I can't remember. Three times, five times a day. I think it was three times. And what would he do? He would face Jerusalem. And pray, right? Where, where do you reckon that comes from? Well, it, we're going to find out today that that has to do with this passage right here. This passage right here. That he would go and face Jerusalem. Okay, have you ever thought about that before? Why would do that? It has to be tied in. That, that was it. I never gave it much thought before until I got to read all of this and everything. But I have no doubt in my mind it's, it's based on this right here. All right, so let's let's look at some of these. Now I'm going to hit high points. So once again, you know, when people are hitting high points, you need to go back and read between the points, right? All right, Second Chronicles chapter two. Now David, David, Solomon's father wanted to build God a house, a temple, but he could not do it because he was a man of war, right? So David got a, a lot of material in in the gold and silver and utensils ready for this. So David was preparing for Solomon to build the temple because God told him that your son Solomon is going to build the temple. Okay? Alright. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now Solomon decided to build a house, that's a temple, for the name of the Lord and a royal palace for himself. So, Solomon has decided to do this. Now, Solomon didn't have to do this. He chose to do this. David got everything ready. God put it on his heart. Solomon could have said, no, I'm not going to do it. But he chose to do this. So, Solomon decided to be obedient to what God wanted him to do and to build this temple for himself. I mean, for, for, for God and for a palace for himself. Okay? Remember, we're looking at context. Look at chapter 3. It says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Priam, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Onan, the Jebusite. So, from chapter 2 to chapter 3, Solomon has now begun to build. Now, when Solomon says that Solomon's begun to build, Solomon ain't out there hammering nails, right? Solomon's a king, so he's got thousands of craftsmen, thousands of people that they kind of taken over, and so they're kind of a bond servant slave type thing, you know, so they're all doing this. So God's using all of this. But Solomon now has, has begun to build a temple. Okay? Turn to chapter 5 now. <clears throat> Verse 1. Thus all the work that Solomon performed for the house of the Lord was finished. So, uh, my memory serves me right, this is about a seven year project. So Solomon has built the, built the temple, Solomon has built his palace, and it's taken seven years. Okay, so we're looking seven years later, kind of like Murdy mentioned on the art, you know, Noah, which who did, who did build, who did get out there hammering the nails and all that kind of stuff, this was about a, about a 120 year project. So that's faithfulness, isn't it? To trust that God's going to do what he said, and you, you don't see it for 120 years. Think about that. All right, so anyway, Solomon has begun, Solomon has begun to build a temple in, in chapter 5. Thus all the work that Solomon performed for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and all the utensils, and put them in the treasuries of the house of God. All right, so everything that David had gotten ready, Solomon has now brought to the temple. Okay, then look what he does. Then Solomon assembled to Jerusalem the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribe and the leaders of the father's households of the sons of Israel to bring 
up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David with his Zion. So David calls for all the leaders in all of Israel. The kingdom is together now, so we're talking 12 tribes. He's got them all together. He brings the leaders up there, and this is going to be an official thing. We're, we're going to bring the ark, where it's at now, to the temple and place it in the temple. Okay? So this is something that, you know, he's involving all of Israel. All of Israel is involved in this now. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 14, they, they bring up, of course, remember, let me, let me, remember when David tried to move the ark one time, what happened? They didn't move it the right way, as God had prescribed. The ark rocked, and was it Uzzah that went up and put his hands on it, and he died instantly, you know. So this time, they're doing it the right way. Solomon learned from the mistake that David made, and they're bringing it up the right way, you know, with the Levites carrying it and so forth. So now they've got the ark up into the temple to the Holy of Holies. Verse 14. Let me, let me just actually read. Let's start with verse 11. They're, all the priests are coming together and they're praising and they're singing and they're doing all of this. In verse 13, in unison when the trumpets and the singers were to make themselves heard with one voice, one voice, unity, to praise and to glorify the Lord. And they lifted up their voice, accompanied by the trumpets, the cymbals, and instruments of music. And when they had praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Then the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. So God's glory, God's very presence, came down into the, into the temple, into the Holy of Holies. And it was so bright. The Shekinah glory cloud of, of God, it was so bright that they couldn't even minister anymore. They had, they had to get out. It was just overwhelming to them. So that it gives me an indication right there that God is pleased with what's happening. Right? He's pleased there. He, his very presence is there. The fact that they, that they have built this house for him. And you'll read in between, the, in between the points there, you know, Solomon acknowledges, you know, there's no house that can hold God, you know. But this is a place that God has ordained for himself, for his people ever, to be with him and be with him. His presence was there. The very presence of God was in this house. Okay? So the temple, so the priest could not even minister. All right? So then Solomon begins to speak to the people. He begins to tell the people, you know, and say well, what he's been doing and why he's doing it and so forth. And he begins to pray to God, dedicating this house. Okay? Look at verse 16. Here is what Solomon is praying to God before the people. Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your sons take heed to their way and to walk in my law as you have walked before me. So Solomon reminds God what God has said. God has promised David multiple things, but a one will put an eternal throne, an eternal dynasty, and so on. But he said, God told David, he said, you will not lack a descendant to sit on the throne of Israel. But he throws something in there. He says, if only they will walk before me. Okay? Now, the promise that God made to David was unconditional. Which means that God was going to fulfill it no matter what. But for David's descendants to enjoy it, they had to be obedient. And we know from history, we know from our last study, that they didn't, did this Because the Romans were in charge. We know that the Babylonians took them over, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. And even today, you know, there is no... There is no descendant of David on the throne in a literal temple. But the promise that God made to David is unconditional. God said, I'm going to do this. And ultimately, we know it's fulfilled by Jesus, right? Who is what? The son of David. So to enjoy the promise that God made, they were going to have to be obedient. Of course, we know they did. But Solomon is reminding God 
Then God is just king. Just, just not call God for God. Right, but just for our own benefit. We, you know, we quote God's promises for our, our benefit. God doesn't need to be reminded. But we do that for us so that we remind ourselves what God has said. Okay? Look at verse 21. And listen to the supplications of thy servant and thy people when they pray toward this place. Did you catch that? When they pray toward this place. What was, what was Daniel doing? Praying toward Jerusalem, toward the temple, where the temple was. Because when Daniel was, when Daniel was praying, the temple was, was just starting to be rebuilt again. But he was praying toward Jerusalem, toward the city of God. Hear thou from that dwelling place from heaven. Hear and forgive. So as Solomon's praying, he says, when I pray, when the people pray, if we've done something wrong, we, we, we pray toward your presence. Toward this house, toward this temple, toward this city. Just hear from heaven and forgive us. Verse 24. And if thy people Israel, who we talk about? Israel, right? If thy people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against thee, and they have sinned against thee, and they return to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication before thee in this house. Then hear thou from heaven, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them back to the land which thou hast given to them and to their fathers. So Solomon is acknowledging that if we sin, and we are taken captive, we are, we're taken out of the land. He's saying, if this happens, it's because of sin. Not because of obedience, right? Because, because of sin. If we do this because of sin, then hear us. When we turn, when we repent, hear from heaven. Bring us back to the land that you have given us. Did you ever think why David was able to face Goliath so easily? It appears here. He knew that the land that that giant was standing on was his. Yeah. God had given me, had given Israel that land. And he knew this giant and his Philistine army had no business there. His faith in God was that much. That's how he could face it. Faith in life. So that's basically what Solomon's saying. This land you give us, if we are taken out and we repent, hear from heaven, bring us back. Bring us back. 26. When the heavens are shut up, and there's no rain because they have sinned against thee again. And they pray toward this place. Once again, toward this, this temple. And confess thy name. And turn from their sin when thou dost afflict them. Then hear from heaven. Forgive the sin of thy servant and thy people Israel. Indeed, teach them the good way in which they should walk. And send a rain on the land which thou hast given to the people for an inheritance. So he prays, God, if we sin against you and you shut up the heavens and there's no rain, you know, our fault once again, we sin. But if we turn back to you and we pray, we confess our sins, you know, then heal. Send the rain in this place. Th these are all the things that Solomon is asking of God in front of the congregation. Verse 27, uh, excuse me, 28. If there is a famine in the land, if there is pestilence, there is blight or mildew, if there is locusts or grasshopper, if their enemies besiege them in the land of their cities, whatever plague or whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer or supplication is made by any man or by all thy people Israel, each knowing his own affliction and his own pain and spread his hands toward his house, then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and render to, a, to each according to all his way. Those who hear thou knowest, for thou, has, thou alone dost know the hearts of men. So he's saying that, once again, if there's a plague or pestilence, guys, we're dealing with one right now, right? That's why some of y'all got masks on. That's why we can't go and you can't have the freedom. A pestilence. 
basically plague, sickness. He says, if this takes place, because of sickness, then here, when we turn, when we turn, when we pray, then forgive. These are all the things. Remember, this is all what Solomon did. We haven't heard anything from God here, right? Other than the fact that his, his glory has filled the temple. We haven't, had, we haven't heard a reply from God yet. Solomon just laid it all out. Okay? 36. And here's Solomon acknowledging that we're going to sin, basically. He says, When they sin against thee, for there is no man who does not sin. Right? We know that, right? There is no man who does not sin. When they sin against thee, there is no man who does not sin. And thou art angry with them, and dost deliver them to an enemy, so that they take them away captive to the land, far off or near, if they take thought in the land where they are taken captive, and repent, and make supplication to thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned. And committed iniquity. And have acted wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart. With all their soul. In the land of their captivity. Where they have been taken captive. And pray toward their land. Which thou hast given to their fathers. And the city which thou hast chosen. And toward the house that I have built for thee. Then hear from heaven. From thy dwelling place. Their prayer and supplication. And maintain their cause. And forgive thy people who have sinned against thee. So once again, if we're taking captive and all this takes place and in that land that you, that you have allowed us to be taken captive and we ask forgiveness and come to you, Solomon said, if this takes place, then here. He says, we are going to sin, you know, because everybody's sin. But if we do this and judgment comes, then come to them and hear when they repent. When they pray. So see, Solomon, God, Solomon knows God's heart. Solomon knows that God is so willing, so much more willing than us sometimes, to want to forgive them. So he keeps repeating this. the same kind of thing. You know, in Daniel chapter 7, I think it's interesting too. I, I was, when I was reading this, I thought of, I thought of the, the Daniel chapter 9. I'm, I, I'm sorry. They've been in captivity for... 70 years in Babylon. And chapter 9 starts with Daniel confessing his sin in the sin of his people. And there's a lot to this as part of our end time study. But Daniel knows that if he'll do this, that God's going to forgive and he's going to restore. So when you start looking at all the background, what Daniel knows and everything, you know, it makes so much more sense on what he's doing and why he's doing it. All right? So, God's been listening to Solomon as he's praying. What's his reaction? Look at verse 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Now, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house again. Was God pleased with Solomon's prayer? He absolutely was. Because it said what? How many times? How many times in history have you read about fire coming down from heaven and consuming a sacrifice? I take a warning right off of that. That was a lie on that part. So we see another time that this took place. That God is pleased. He's pleased with what Solomon has prayed. So much for more. So much so that His glory is very present. Build the temple again. Okay. Verse 11 says basically Solomon has completed everything he planned to do. So he goes to sleep that night. And here is our passage for today. I'm going to start with verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among the people. So God said, if I do any of this, that I've just named. He said, if I do this, and my people, Israel, 
who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God says, if I do this, it causes your sin and you'll humble yourself. We see humility. And pray. Right? Prayer is essential. Uh, we have discussions many times. Guys, I think it was on Tuesday night sometimes we talked about prayer and God's sovereignty. God's going to do what He's going to do. All that's true. But it doesn't change the fact that God said to pray. Humble yourself and pray. If you'll do this, humble yourself and pray. Seek my face. In other words, be devoted to God. Seek His presence, His face. That's what He's talking about. Seek His presence. Devote yourself to, to knowing God. And what else? There's got to be a turning. There's got to be a repentance. God says, if you'll do this, then I will hear. Now, if, if God lies, he's sovereign. He said, if you'll do this, then I will hear. Okay? I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Guys, the steps we just had, do you see any kind of humility, any kind of repentance, any kind of devotion to God from the Pharisees and so forth? There was none there, was there? They never grew as a whole. It was not there. So therefore, they were still in captivity. They did not have to be. God came to offer the kingdom. They could have repented. They could have turned. God said, if you'll do this, I will hear. And you've heard me say it. like this one day they're going to. It's going to be tough to get there. But one day they're going to. And God will do this. God will heal. God will restore in the nation as a whole. Every, every Jew left alive will know Jesus as Savior. Alright? So context we're talking. God promised to Israel. Here's a verse that really jumped out at me when I was doing this and studying this. Turn back to chapter 6. Like I said, there's no, there can be no argument that this context is talking about Israel. Look at verse 32 though. Chapter 6. Solomon praying. And we know that what? That God sent fire from heaven, right? He sent fire from heaven. His glory filled the, the temple. So God was pleased with what Solomon prayed. This is part of Solomon's prayer. Also concerning the foreigner who is not from thy people Israel. Who does that include? Everybody who's not a Jew. That includes me. As a Gentile, every Gentile. Solomon says, also concerning the foreigner who is not from thy people Israel, when he comes from a far country, for thy great name's sake, in thy mighty hand, in thy, in thy outstretched arm, when they come and pray toward this house, then hear thou from heaven, from thy dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls thee to do, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know that know thy name and fear thee and as do thy people Israel, that they may know that this house which I have built is called by thy name. So he says basically when the Gentiles come, for your name's sake, not for our own benefits, not for our own wealth, not for our own ease, but when I when the Gentile comes, the foreigner comes, and he prays for your name's sake. And he wants you to be glorified. He says, then hear from heaven. And do all they want to do. Because it's for your glory, God. God, that includes us. Context and all this was talking about Israel, but that includes us. When we do this for God's glory. You've heard me say for three or four weeks now that you know, Lisa and I have been praying for our country. Our country needs God. We need to turn back. For God's glory. And that people will know if there's a God in heaven. And that God will be free to move more so. Because he many times limits himself, right? Not that he can't do anything, but he limits himself based on what people choose much, much of the time. So if we as a people and I believe, it, I believe it has to start with God's people. If we as people humble ourselves and pray and seek His face for His glory, then we look forward to Him keeping us. But we've got a choice. Just like the Pharisees said, 
just like the Jews had, just like the, the northern tribes had. But, you know, they got a choice. We can sit back and let it go, or we can choose to humble ourselves in Christ and seek God and see what, step back in and just look what he's going to do if we'll do this. So, all that being said, Whether you can show up Saturday or you cannot show up. That's between you and God. I don't know what you got going and all that. But begin to pray for our country. If you haven't been, begin to pray earnestly for our country. You know, that God's, that the knowledge of God may spread. Because right now, when you when you look at the policies and everything else of, the, of our country, it's going so much away from God. Even at, even at churches, guys. Yeah are ignoring what God's promises are. They're ignoring what God says is right and what's wrong. And Scripture clearly says that, you know, that that's going to happen. When God gives people over to a reprobate mind, they can't tell truth from error, then they begin to call good evil and evil good. That's exactly where we're at in so much of our country today. It does not have to be that way, though. God's heart is for us to turn and repent. You know, to humble us devote ourselves to him. So whatever form it takes in your life, let me encourage you to make that step today. Choose to do that. Um, we're going to be, I'm thinking about looking at some studies, doing, doing some study on prayer for saying to, I looked at it some this last week and it's kind of dawning. So I asked for your prayer on that because there's so much involved in it. And I, not even, as I begin to dig into it, so much involved in it. Uh, but I think it's, that's where my heart is right now as we're doing this. So, so any questions? Comments? You know, for the longest time, because I missed that one verse, I knew the context of talking about Israel. But when I read that about the foreigner, that includes me too. That includes us. God's heart is to, is to heal, right? It's to, it's to heal the land, to heal the people, you know, to, to give us that heart toward Him. Do we want it? I guess that's the question that's always there, you know, do we really want it? We believe God will do what He says. So, trust Him.
you close us in prayer, please?
between love and unhappiness. We thank you for